when a person is healthy and when a person is wealthy, then a person is uh, happy. And so are these dogs. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pao Chuning Dorji um, and I'm a photographer uh, and I also like to call myself a wanderer. You know, um, in a way, I'm hopelessly romantic. Uh, I'm a very sentimental person. And I feel memories. Uh, memories are something that, uh, um, in a strange way, very sad. Uh, it's very sentimental because they come and they invoke all these emotions in us, you know, happiness, joy, sorrow. But then, just like everything else in life, the, the circle of life, it slowly disappears and it gets replaced by new memories. And me being sentimental, uh, I always found myself longing uh, to cling on to these disappearing memories. And that's how I got interested in photography. I realized that photography, in a way, um, lets me cling on to these uh, memories for a little bit longer. So before I start my talk, I wanted to share with you all different photos that I have uh, taken from across the world as I travel around. Uh, so the first photo is uh, from um, the Hunza Valley in Pakistan. And this was where... Uh, the word Shangri-La was first coined. Um, James Milton, who wrote The Lost Horizon, had been to this valley and he stood here where I was standing and he said, I think this place should be called Shangri-La. So this is the original Shangri-La. Uh, the second photo is uh, from the Arayashiyama bamboo forest in Kyoto. And then this one is in Varanasi, sunrise over the Ganges. And then this is uh, in the Karakoram Mountains of northern Pakistan. This is in the Gobi Desert of uh, China. Uh, this is also in northern Pakistan. Many places I, I travel to uh, are places where I go and then suddenly I realize, wait a minute, why am I here? You know, maybe I shouldn't have been here, but... Uh, uh, here I was again, you know, probably one of the only foreigners there, if not the only one. Uh, this is me uh, jumping over the Himalayas in Chelela. This is in the Bamiyan uh, village of Afghanistan. This is, uh, I call it the run of joy uh, taken in Sri Lanka. And this is monks uh, begging for arms. Uh, along the coastline of Hua Hin in Thailand. Uh, I decided to uh, call the stock Circling Happiness and I'm calling it a visual journey into the values, traditions and culture of Bhutan. And I have uh, made uh, the, uh, the talk in three groups. Uh, the first one is called Lotus Blooms, which focuses on the spiritual traditions of Bhutan. Uh, the second one is on, of course, uh, what is Bhutan without happiness? So it is on happiness. And the third section I'm uh, talking on uh, the circle of karma, uh, which kind of relates to the world we live in and how uh, we Bhutanese believe in karma, you know, lay jumde as we call it. When I thought about my talk, this photo was perfect. In a way, I find that this girl, this little girl, uh, I photographed her in Wang Di Podong and her name is Sonam Chudun. I feel like she really personifies our country right now. You know, we are a young country, we are an infant country, you could say that. But in a way, we have so much innocence and so much joy and so much happiness within us. So I think this is a very fitting photo, I think, to start with it. So why circling, um, circling happiness? Well, number one, happiness, I think it is uh, synonymous with Bhutan. 
you know, uh, the moment you uh, enter the Druk Air or the Tashi Air flight from wherever you're coming into Bhutan and you open the in-flight magazine, there you see it, Bhutan. Happiness is a place. Happiness is so important to us uh, Bhutanese that uh, we even, um, you know, have uh, offices, right? The Gross National Happiness Commission. Uh, we have the pillars of Gross National Happiness. We have all that. So that's why without happiness, I think we cannot talk about Bhutan. But also the reason why I called it circling. Circling is because um, if you look at happiness in terms from our Buddhist perspective, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you guys a story first. It is said that when Prince Siddhartha became the Buddha, he had 32 major marks on his body. Some were, some were very strange, like he, his foot was flat. Uh, apparently, when he stood up straight, he could scratch his knees standing straight without bending down, you know, his arms were so long. Uh, but then one of the 32 major marks was he had this lump on his head, I guess something like this. Um, and uh, in Cheke, it's called uh, the Tsuktur, and in Sanskrit, it's referred to as the Ushnisha. Now, uh, he had this Ushnisha on his head, and it is said that everyone who saw the Buddha was somehow drawn to it. They were magnetized by it, and they longed for it. They wanted to see it, but they could not see it clearly. They wanted to touch it, but when they reached for it, they couldn't reach it. So in a way, overcome with this deep sense of longing, you know, longing for the unreachable, trying to reach for the unreachable, what, what happened? People started doing circles around the Buddha. I mean, that, that, that's what happens, right? I mean, if you are really, really hungry and then you haven't eaten for days and suddenly someone puts a plate of juicy pakshasikam in front of you and you want to eat it, but you're not allowed to eat it. You just, I guess, salivate and circle around it. So the term circling comes from there. And if I'm not mistaken, that is also where this whole habit and culture of doing kora, circumambulating our chetans and lagans came from. Longing for the unreachable, you know, desiring and trying to reach for it, something that you cannot reach. So that's where it came from. So for me, if we talk about happiness, I think it is something like that. It is something that you can long for, but you cannot reach it. It is something that you can, uh, you, you know, desire to have it, but you cannot. So I will talk about happiness later on. But the message I'm trying to put across here is happiness is not the destination, but it is rather the journey. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, enough on the topic. Let us uh, talk about uh, Bhutan. So the first topic uh, that we'll be getting into is called Lotus Blooms. And that, with that, I want to focus a little bit on Buddhism in Bhutan. But, you know, when you talk about Buddhism in in general, it's it's very very difficult uh, to uh, you know get into like it's it's just so much there. Um, you know, I always tell my foreign friends, you all have uh, the Quran. You know, the Muslims have the Quran, Christians have their Bible. Uh, you know, the Jews have the uh, Ten Commandments. Hinduism, they have the Bhagavad Gita. But I said in Buddhism, we don't have one text. We have 84,000 volumes that covers everything, you know, even if you, uh, you know, try to finish from the beginning till the end, it would take uh, weeks, if not months, to finish it. It's, there's just so much there. So, uh, when you look at how much there is in Buddhism, it's very difficult to say, okay, I want to talk about Buddhism in five minutes, you say. So, uh, with my photos here, I just wanted to touch upon the little bits of Buddhism that uh, are that just, I think, explain it in a nutshell, you could say. And the first thing that I wanted to say is that Buddhism is not a religion. Now, why I say that is because um, when you talk about religion, if you look up the word religion in the dictionary, 
the one word that you will see is God. It is a path where you uh, give yourself up or you take refuge in a God, they say. Religion, uh, I think when you say religion, there is always that notion of God. But in Buddhism, we do not have a God. We do not have a Jiktan Pai Jepapo. In fact, um, you know, if you, I think, ask many of the great masters of Buddhism, how did the world start, you know? One of the answers that they will give is, everything is dreamlike. And when you start dreaming, do you ever remember the moment the dream started? Or how the dream was created? So keeping that in mind, you know, Buddhism does not have a God. We don't have a Jigden by Jepapo. So it is not a religion. It is a philosophy. It is a way of life. So, uh, I, uh, you know, Zongsa Kensi Rinpoche has his book, uh, what, uh, what Makes You Not a Buddhist. And there he says, as long as you believe in the four seals, which is um, all compounded things are impermanent, all emotions are pain, and everything that we see inherently is non-existent. And number four, um, nirvana is uh, beyond concepts. If you believe in this four, that's, that's Buddhism for you, no God. So when we talk about, now when you, you might be saying, oh, Pao is saying that there is no God in Buddhism, then what is uh, Chen Rizhi? You know, what is Jambeyam? And I do hear that a lot. I, I do sometimes when I go to Kichu and Taksang, I do hear um, you know, people, uh, the guides, introducing the bodhisattvas uh, to their uh, guests and they say, oh, this is the god of compassion. This is the god of wisdom. But that is the wrong term. Bodhisattva is not a god. Um, bodhisattva, for example, here is an image of uh, Chatong Chentong, uh, Chen Rizhi with a thousand arms and thousand eyes. Now, as in every, with everything in Buddhism, we have um, the ultimate and the relative. So, in the relative, we have Chen Rizhi, we have thousand arms, thousand eyes. Um, but I think the best way to explain it is, I think everyone loves puppies. Who cannot love a puppy? You know, cute, adorable, innocent. And you have this cute puppy and somehow if this, somehow, like for example, suddenly a car comes and hits this puppy and this puppy is in pain and he's suffering and he's crying. The person who adored this puppy suddenly looks at this puppy with undistracted compassion when he's not thinking about the vacation he's taking tomorrow or um, the, his uh, girlfriend from yesterday, that undistracted moment where he's not thinking about the moment before and the moment after and he is just overcome with the sense of compassion at that very moment, then that is the ultimate Chen Rizhi. That is Cha Tong Chen Tong for you and that is in your heart. But in the relative level, we humans, we love to connect. We love tangible things. So we say, okay, okay, you know, if compassion was a person, he would be this person with a thousand arms, thousand eyes. And that changes. Now, for example, Chen Rizhi might be Cha Tong Chen Tong in Bhutan. If you go to China, Chen Rizhi becomes a Kuan Ying, a woman, because they feel like when you talk about compassion, it has to have that feminine, mother-like feel. So Chen Rizhi becomes a woman. And I've been to Afghanistan where Chen Rizhi is a bearded man. Because maybe for the people living in Afghanistan, compassion looks like a man with, with, a, with a beard, you know. So ultimate and relative. And again here, what I would like to touch upon is the cultural aspect of Buddhism. You know, um, culture is very important, don't get me wrong. Um, but you see Buddhism exists in different countries, from India to Nepal to China, Korea, Japan, Bhutan, Tibet, Ladakh. But what you see is the essence is the same, but the culture is different. Culture is very important, don't get me wrong. Without culture, you know, there is no way we can say this is Bhutan. But 
The example I would like to give here is Buddhism is the water that we drink. Culture is the cup. In Bhutan, we might like an ivory cup with silver lining, turquoise studded. In Japan, they might like a wooden cup. In China, they might like a porcelain cup. Cup is important to drink the water, which is the teaching of the Buddha. But the cup can be anything. If you are desperate, you can even drink it in your hand. Why I call my topic on Buddhism lotus blooms, and I have this beautiful photo of Zong Sakin Sri uh, doing his uh, mandala offerings in Bodh Gaya to talk about lotus blooms. One of the teachings in Buddhism is that um, they say that, you know, when the lotus blooms, the lotus never blooms in clear, clean water. I don't know how the water is over here, but for the lotus to bloom, there has to be mud, there has to be muck, there has to be dirt. Only with the combination of all that and light, water, these cause and conditions coming together, then you have this beautiful lotus blooming out. Now this is very important because the message here that the Buddha is giving us is that for our mind to bloom, we need the muck, we need the dirt, we need all that. And by mud and muck and dirt, the Buddha is referring to your emotions. So out of desire, hatred, attachment, anger, using that, we Buddhists use that to let our mind bloom radiantly like this beautiful lotus. So that's why I, I, I called uh, this particular chapter Lotus Blooms. The thing I wanted to touch upon uh, as we talked about Buddhism uh, in Bhutan is this whole notion of um, outer and inner connection. I think that is something that's very important in Buddhism, especially in Bhutan. And for example, I took this photo in Singizong when I went up there. And this is in Taksang. Now, why do we go on pilgrimages to places like Singizong? Why do we go on pilgrimages to places like Taksang? Now, the thing is, when you talk about Singizong, the lion fortress, there's a certain uh, emotion that it invokes, you know. When you talk about the lion, it's majestic, it's fearless, you know. And even Taktsang, tiger's nest, the tiger is fearless, it is regal, you know, it is noble. So we go through these hardships. I mean, going to Singizong is very difficult. You have to trek for three days. And you go to Singizong, going through all this hardship, because you are visiting this outer Singizong, the outer lion fortress, and you're going there hoping that that outer lion fortress connects with the most important lion fortress. That is your heart, your mind, your mind that is lion-like, that is majestic, that is fearless. And you hope that the outer lion fortress connects with and awakens your inner lion fortress. That is why we go to uh, Nes. Similarly, even to Taksang, you know, we go to the outer tiger's nest, hoping that it will connect, awaken our inner tiger-like mind. It's called tiger's nest and lion fortress uh, for a reason. So with that, we conclude uh, our br brief, uh, you know, um, talk on uh, uh, Buddhism in Bhutan. <laughs>